Hi, it's Drake. Uh, I'm just going to make a short introduction video on the Hungarian writer Miklos Senkuthi. Um, just going to do a short overview of his life and then go into the four works that are in English now and, uh, and then talk a little bit about how I feel about him. So, um, yeah, his real name is Miklos Fisterer something like that, uh, but he went under the pseudonym Miklos Senkuthi, which I think breaks down to Sent is like saint or, or holy, and then uh, Kut is like fountain, and then a Y is supposed to signify some like, I think, nobility or something like that. There's There's an essay written in the Hyperion issue, uh, which is also published by the Contramundum Press, which puts out all of his books in English. Uh, they put they made a St. Uh, edition, and you can find it online for free on their website. So, um, yeah, if you want to learn a lot more than this video shows, I would recommend uh, getting a hold of that. Um... But yeah, so he was born in Budapest in 1908, which puts him about 10 years after Faulkner was born and about 14 years before Gaddis. Uh, yeah, just to give an idea. And um, he started publishing really early. His first book came out in 1934 when he was 26 uh, that was Prey which is a I mean it's amazing that someone that young put, put it out and uh, let's see yeah it was paid for the publishing was paid for by his father and it was actually inspired or conceived while him and his father were on a trip around Europe and uh, he talks quite a lot about um, some recollections of the time there's this autobiographical like series of aphorisms or paragraphs type things uh, called pray my recollections parts one and two that you can find online on Hungarian literature online. If you go on that website and search Senkuthi, you can find like 10 articles or something like that. The oldest ones are translated by the translator who does all of his books, uh, Tim Wilkinson, uh, which is, they're very interesting. He tells really good anecdotes and he was a really neat guy. And, uh, so yeah, when he was 26, he put out Prey, and by this time he had been a, a teacher, and uh, he had actually gotten a degree in literature, and his dissertation was on Ben Jonson. So uh, he was fluent in English. I'm pretty sure he lived in London for a little while, and he had a real appreciation for English language literature. He later uh, was known for um, translating Ulysses into Hungarian, you know, which isn't easy in any language. Um, yeah, going back, he uh, his father published Prey, which is like 1,200 pages in the original Hungarian. Uh, you know, wasn't popular at all. Uh, people didn't understand it. And then... I believe it was, yeah, one year later he published a, well anyway, I'll show you Prey, because I have it here. So that's uh, that's what Prey looks like. It's by uh, Contramundum Press, and this is only volume one. Uh, it's 700 pages, volume two still has to come out. But uh, yeah, it's it's a very interesting book. It starts out, by talking about uh, the design of a novel and uh, prey is supposed to signify the word supposed to signify a a like um, 
a prologue to the rest of his work. I think it mentions on the back here, um, or an overture to my subsequent work. So that's what Prey is supposed to be. And uh, it's pretty interesting. The person, on whoever wrote this, the editor, uh, compared it to, um, I guess, what Northrop Fry calls an anatomy, like Lucian, Lu yeah, Lucian, Rabelais, or Burton. And Burton is one of the highlights of that because, of course, Senkuthi was um, very knowledgeable in English literature, and he read Burton and really enjoyed Burton quite a lot in The Anatomy of Melancholy, uh, which I have here, and it's published by um, the New York Review Books Classics, which is a really nice edition, although it's extremely thick. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's a good book, too. And then, uh, so, yeah, when that came out, no one really, no one really got it, and then it had two subsequent reprintings, I think, in... 1980 and then like I think in the 2000s or something like that and that's when it really started picking up um, but anyway so that's his first book came out and then his second one a year later is a series of aphorisms um, which are actually very good uh, it's called Towards the One and Only Metaphor it's a pretty neat cover there and that's, uh, of course, also by Contramundum Press. And um, when I was reading those, and also Prey, um, the most distinct impression I got for another writer was Fernando Pessoa, um, who's, who's well known for his uh, Book of Disquiet, um, which is a factless autobiography that came out in the 1980s, so 50 years after he died. And it's also kind of like, a, a Prey was described as um, work towards an impossible novel. And I think you could also view uh, the Book of Disquiet as work towards an impossible work, where it ends up being just, you know, excerpts or little bits from a work that is uh, unfinished or maybe unfinishable. Um, because, uh, yeah, one of the quotes from the Book of Disquiet is, I am in large measure the self-same prose I write. So I guess if you're getting extravagant with it, that means um, the book ends when he dies, which I guess is what happened. But... Um, yeah, apart from that, uh, masks are uh, important in Senkuthi's work. Of course, he changed his last name as a you know pen name, which is maybe more common than needs to be highlighted. But um, yeah, he takes a lot of different like alternate viewpoints um, but they could also be construed as him uh, like he'll talk about these uh, you know more intellectual uh, theologians or something like that or um, a uh, very intellectually interested Frenchman or something like that who's also trying to write a novel you know this or that it's uh it's very interesting, and in the same way, uh, Pessoa does that, of course, with his heteronyms. Um, the Book of Disquiet is written by one of his heteronyms, Bernardo Suarez. And uh, if you're interested in Pessoa, we have a podcast episode on uh, A Tale Told by an Idiot podcast, which is on YouTube. But yeah, the, there's two other volumes of P Pessoa that I really like, a little larger than the entire universe which is, uh, all three of these are translated by Richard Zenith, and then uh, Fernando Pessoa and Co., which is another... These two poem collections have very little overlap with each other. But anyway, I, I would say if you like Fernando Pessoa, 
I would highly recommend checking out Sint Kuthi and the other way around. If you really like Sint Kuthi, I would highly recommend checking out Pessoa because uh, of course I can't read them in the original, but they are two of the best modernist writers I've read. Um, Sint Kuthi also has similarities with Robert Musil, who was uh, publishing The Man Without Qualities, contemporary with Prey and his other works. Um, yeah, so then um, I believe he published one work in between uh, towards the one and only metaphor and the next book I'm going to talk about, which is um, Marginalia on Casanova, which is the first volume in the St. Orvius Breviary. And uh, his idea behind this was um, he had just annotated a large selection of volumes of Casanova's uh, History of My Life. Uh, you know, Casanova, the famous Italian intellectual and seducer and con man, you know, with masks and stuff. Well, anyway, uh, so after he had done that, he also had been reading Karl Barth, who does a commentary on, I believe it was Romans, but I, I, always, I always mess that one up. But anyway, so he was inspired to do a similar commentary line by line of Casanova, and that was his marginalia on Casanova. And, uh, you know, Casanova was a very interesting guy, and the uh, 18th century that he writes in and lived almost all of is uh, one of the most interesting centuries in recent times. So uh, if you look at Casanova, he knew a lot of people and did a lot of interesting things. So you can almost talk about anything, is what I gather. And that's basically what St. Kuthi does. And it says, I believe it says on the back here that uh, he, his goal was to uh, synthesize 2,000 years of European culture and St. Orpheus leads St. Kuthi like uh, Virgil does for Dante in the uh, Commedia as an omniscient poet who guides us not through hell but through all recorded history, myth, religion, and literature. And uh, yeah, St. Orpheus is kind of like uh, combines the classic and the Christian But yeah, anyway, um, this is a very good book, too. It's easier, I, I'd say, so it's easier to read than pray in the sense that uh, you can just read it and it's basically a bunch of little anecdotes and digressions on different parts of history. But it is, a, if, you, uh, if you don't like European history or don't read a lot of classics, it's a steep learning curve for the... Uh, the allusions and references he makes because each page has like five that really aren't that common like uh, he may talk about uh, let's say you know Tiepolo or some Italian Baroque painter and then he'll talk about uh, some Pope at the time and then he'll talk about uh, Rousseau's you know writings and then some philosopher from the time you know and that'll be all on one page, but he does it well, but it may be somewhat overwhelming for someone who doesn't have a good background in the European history of the time and then the literature of the time, too. But uh, it's as far as the writing style goes, it's, it's not um, obscurant. And then the last book that's out in English right now, which just came out a couple months ago, is uh, Black Renaissance, which was actually published the same year as the first volume of the St. Orpheus Breviary. And uh, this is basically a continuation of it, and it focuses on um, three different people. Um, the composer Monteverdi, uh, then Brunelleschi, and then uh, a tutor to tutor to Elizabeth Tudor and 
So yeah, I mean, I haven't I haven't really looked into this one too much because I just got it. But um, the other three I've read fair amounts of, and uh, they're very good. So I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but I figure um, in honor of uh, Senkuthi's interest in um, good English literature, I'll read uh, one of Shakespeare's sonnets, which is number 30. And uh, this is how it goes. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes, new wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow for precious friends hid in death's dareless night, oh, dateless night, Dane, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored, and sorrows end. All right, so, uh, yeah, if you've read Senkuthi, please um, leave a comment, tell me what you thought. Uh... Yeah, I'd really recommend him. He's he's really good. So, all right. Also read William Gaddis. They have he has a lot of similarities to Sankuthi too. All right, Death is a Gang Boss.